I'll, I'll start by introducing Seth Andrews. Um, Seth has a beautifully appointed studio from which he's uh, <laughs> speaking. <laughs> um, Seth is a video producer and a former Christian broadcaster and is a member of the American Atheist Board of Directors. Um, he is an author of four books, including Deconverted, A Journey from Religion to Reason, Sacred Cows, A Lightheaded Look at Belief and Tradition. And uh, his most recent book that is out now and you should get is Confessions of a Former Chris Fox News Christian. It's great. And you should uh, certainly go, go buy that on uh, at your local bookstore. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, he is the host of the Thinking Atheist podcast, uh, which is just a fantastic podcast and community uh, that does some really great work for folks uh, who are journeying out of religion. Um, Seth, I'll turn it over to you, and you can introduce uh, Chris if you would like, and we can uh, and we'll go from there. Yeah, I like being able to uh, interview somebody about their book, but mostly we talk about my book. I think th I like this setup very much. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's a good model for me. So yeah, I'm just. I'm, I'm. Yeah, we'll just the rest of the convention. We'll just do this. I have had the honor of uh, talking twice on the podcast with uh, Chris Matheson. He's uh, likely best known as uh, one of the writers for the Bill and Ted films. And this is, this is my generation, right? I'm an 80s child. Uh, Excellent Adventure came out. 89, Bogus Journey came out, I think, a couple of years after that. And then all these decades pass, and lo and behold, a new Bill and Ted film arrives. And I think at a very serendipitous time, like we sort of needed that shot in the arm. I'm going to get to that. But the reason that I'd been talking to Chris on the show and part of the reason I wanted to talk to him today is because he's written this book called The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love and hate. Uh, Chris, I mean, how would I describe the book? Is it a satirical book? Do you, I mean, I don't want to call the Bible like nonfiction. Yours is a work of fiction. <laughs> you know, I mean, how do you describe the story of God for people over coffee? Uh, uh it's the Bible told from God's point of view as a comedy, essentially. Um, I guess it is a satire. I guess it qualifies as a satire. Um, I tried to um, make more, you know, make sense of him. So he felt like a character to me, an actual character. So, so that I wasn't just kind of throwing rocks at the ideas, which, you know, it's fun to do. But um, I wanted to sort of get inside the character a bit more, if I could. So I guess it is a satire, but I think it's a character study more than anything else. I mean, this is five years ago, but you're not a stranger to getting into religious issues, right? I mean, did you write or co-write yeah. Rapture Palooza? You want to talk about that at all, that film? Yeah, I wrote that one. That was uh, when I was starting to get really interested in religion and because I didn't, I really was not raised um, in a religion, not, not a organized religion uh, family. Um, so I was a latecomer to it and I got really super interested in it. And then as a comedy writer, I just loved it. You know, like I, I read, um, I started reading kind of the big uh, hit books, I guess, of the nineties, like the conversations with God books that Neil Donald Walsh wrote. I, I loved them. I just thought they were so hilarious and ridiculous. And then I read the Left Behind books. And I thought, this is just so funny. This is so dumb. This makes no sense. This is so crazy. And I thought it was a really funny idea for a movie. So Rapture Palooza is um, about what happened. It's Left Behind. It's, it's, it's the rapture happens and the people who are left behind and the Antichrist shows up. But it's all kind of done naturalistically, like they still just sort of get up and go to work. And the Antichrist is just kind of a, a, an asshole more than anything else. And, and um, you know, they're just annoyed by the fact that it's raining blood and there's little creatures <laughs> running around, you know, with little um, scorpions with golden crowns biting them and saying, suffer, suffer, you know. I thought it was hilariously funny. The movie, I'm afraid, didn't turn out so great, whatever. But um, yeah, yeah, that was like, I wrote that in uh, probably, I don't know, 2002, 2003. I've had some people like situational, like in their brain, they think, all right, let's say the rapture happens tomorrow and all the superstitious people are raptured and then the rest of us are left. And part of us, I was thinking like, I, I, it sounds kind of good. Like I could use the quiet. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, so I'm not saying agree. religious people are bad people, but I, I, I'm not sure I see the problem. Chris. No, it's all right. 
it's all right. Go ahead. We'll be all right. We'll be fine. Go you enjoy know, for yourselves. Go up there to Gumby Land, and you know you can frolic yeah. and drop to your knees and praise, and you know avoid yeah. hell and and yeah. whatever it is. And you, whatever so you're I, gonna do it. You brought this up with Rapture Palooza, and you sort of threw that jab out at the film. I don't want to throw those people under the bus, but I do want to talk about, like, you know, I'm familiar with the writer stereotype, you know, and I wonder if the stereotype speaks to a truth at all. You know, our, our you know, you sit around in the dark, you know, with a, like a ha a lit cigarette on the ear, and you're half lit, and and you know, and you're you're cursing the fates, and you have these creative highs mixed with the crash. That, you know, do you uh, is that a writer thing, or is that just something we tell ourselves about writers? You know, are you uh, are you are you this know, moody you know, diva? Well, Seth, I mean, you've written, you know what it is. You you've written books. I've written so nonfiction. That, you know? Yeah, but you know, I don't the know. There's all kinds of writers. I, one thing that does characterize movie writers, and I just completely played into the stereotype, is when a movie doesn't turn out they just blame everybody else so so yeah. to that extent yes i just, I just but if you're like if you're a writer of a film of any stripe i don't care if it's bill and ted or any of the number of the movies that you've been involved with there does seem to be a little bit of a like a moment of terror perhaps even a season of terror right i was reading i was watching the behind the scenes of uh, the making of alien right dan o'bannon is writing the alien film this classic iconic movie but at one point, you know, it's sort of taken away from him and then it's out of his control and he feels like someone's ripped it out of his hands and are they going to bastardize my creation? So it, does the writer versus producer, studio director, does that whole thing play out in your life? Oh, God, they're going to fuck it up. Does that happen in your skull? Uh, I mean, it just it just depends. It's all it all just depends on your relationships with those people. It doesn't have to to go that way it sometimes does go that way on the sort of totem pole of status yeah the writer is is absolutely lower than the director and and the star i mean unquestionably so you can you can absolutely get rolled on the other hand if you have a good relationship with those people it it, it goes it goes it can go well i mean on the bill and ted movies for instance that that, that didn't really happen very much we got along with with all the directors and producers and we were never like treated badly in that way so denied it, access it, to the set and any of that stuff i mean no not story. at all no not at all the opposite i mean they were happy to have us there and um you know whether that was a good idea on their part or not i, I don't know but they were happy to have us there do um the bill and ted movies i mean like, do the 80s live on, <laughs> 80s and early 90s? I mean, whenever, you know, Face the Music struck like lightning and had really good reviews and, and whatnot. But, I mean, it's, I mean, is it a nostalgia piece? Uh, how do you describe the phenomenon of Bill and Ted in 2020? Wow, that's a good question, Seth. Um, why, <clears throat> you know, Bill and Ted resonated with people and why there was uh, an enough of an interest that we could you know that we were lucky enough to bring them back in 2020 i don't know i mean i think it has something to do with uh they were created out of a lot of joy ed and i had a lot of fun making them we, we kind of loved them from the start and it had a lot to do with alex and keanu just really, really playing them beautifully and um and maybe there is an '80s nostalgia. Uh, I don't know. That that could be. I mean, that, there that was for me. I'm projecting my own '80s nostalgia onto the onto the yeah, films because that's sure. kind of my playground, you know. But yeah, you know, it's it's I, also interesting too because, and you mentioned that Solomon, the co-writer, but you know, like Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves on screen, these totally goofball. And the simpleton's not the word, but they, they just live very. They have a simple view of the world, and it's really, really good, right? But in real life, they're like so freaking smart, right? I mean, Alex Winter just released a fantastic Frank Zappa documentary film, and he's behind the scenes on so many levels. And of course, Keanu, he's just crushed the A-list in Hollywood. Were you surprised Keanu wanted to come back for round three? You know, a lot of I mean, us thought, well, he, yeah, he didn't want to for a while. I, I think that he he had enough of playing Ted. Um, is when we were done with the second one, I don't think he had any interest in playing Ted uh, again. 
And why that changed and how that changed, I don't really know, except at a certain point, maybe 2005, six, I think there was just a little bit of a window that opened and he was more willing. I think he began to feel, he and Alex both began to feel what Ed and I began to feel, which is the, the point of this, what could make this interesting actually is enough times now gone by that they, could, that they can have failed. That's, that's what makes this interesting. Like if we did it two years, if we'd made the third one two years after Bogus Journey, I don't, I don't really know what, what it would have been about, but now like 20 years have gone by and it didn't work out for them. And, and they knew, uh, both Alex and Keanu knew that that was interesting, that that was funny, potentially, and kind of pathetic, and um, that there was something to play. And so I think that, that I, I don't really know what, what brought him back. I'm honestly, um, I have a theory. We just chose to do it. Let me, I have a theory, you know, because Bill and Ted was right around the time that like Keanu played kind of that, I don't know, dull knife of a character in parenthood, right? The film parenthood. And he was always yeah, yeah. kind of at that time before he totally reinvented himself for the umpteenth time. He was kind of that dude, you know, and he, yeah, he sort yeah. of had that single I dimension. Yeah, he plays that same guy, kind of just yeah. the thick, the dull knife. And so I, yeah. Part of me thinks maybe, you know, he's like, I, I've got to bust out of this sort of genre or this pigeonhole or I'll never get out. And then maybe yeah. he came to the point, I'm totally speculating. Maybe he came to the point where he's like, well, you know, now I can do whatever I want. Now it's a choice. It's not something I felt locked into, you know, because there, there's a joy in his performance. And, you know, when it releases yeah. during the time of COVID and I will get to your book in just a second, but I want to talk Bill and Ted first, but you know, Bill and Ted hits during a time of real national and global pessimism, Right. We're locked down. We're unsure about the future. There's pandemonium and chaos and holy shit, what's going to happen next? And so I like for me, face the music is therapy. Like the world isn't all shitty and there is joy and goodness and all that. And I know you wrote it before COVID, <laughs> but did you feel kind of a cultural cynicism that this might counter? Were you, I mean, I don't know, were you sort of playing doctor for the culture when you put it together? Like, you know, we really need a shot in the arm. Let's crank up the joy factor. It sounds like a Barbara Walters question when I say it that way. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I think we, we, we had an awareness that by dealing with their failure and the pain that it caused them and coming out the other side and passing the baton off to their children and how powerful and meaningful that felt to both Ed and me, that that could be really a, a good thing. We had that general feeling. Um, I will say that once Donald Trump got elected, we had it. We began to have a strong feeling this guy is going to help us get our movie made, you know, because there was such a turn towards what we perceived to be a darkening of the climate, a sort of a, a, a roughening of the way people dealt with each other, a heightening of like anger and 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 kind of rage and and. And we felt that that um, Bill and Ted could be um, relevant and and maybe not an antidote, of course not an antidote, but that it could land really well um, as a. I mean, to, I mean, it did to, land during kind of a a time of where there was a lot of I mean, a celebration of cruelty, right? Gleeful yeah, I think cruelty, so. You know. Yeah, I would agree with that. And Bill and Ted are just you know Bill and Ted are are really nice, and Bill and Ted like everybody and bill and ted are very um sincere and so we wanted that and we also on on the level of comedy neither one of us want we don't neither one of us really likes snark and neither one of us is really much of a fan of like heavy irony and self we we wanted it to be kind of um straightforward comedically and um i don't know i think we felt that that was we were both pretty tired of snark. Um, and so I don't know, there was that too. 
A lot of I've stuff. lost your video feed. Oh, I can still up. hear your voice. Uh, I think we've got a little bit of a signal problem. I'm just going to keep going unless the sure. um, the people behind the scenes give me direction to go. Other, I mean, I can talk all night with you, brother. Um, <laughs> I, as much as I hate to tie Donald Trump and God, they both have many of the same. The God of the Bible and Donald mm. Trump have a lot of the same characteristics. And I was reading the story of God again. And I thought about this. I thought, you know, is it hard to caricaturize sort of this bigger than life God character anyway? I mean, like when Trump came out, comedians, I thought, struggled a little bit writing comedy yeah. because the real world was already the caricature. You have almost nowhere to go. And so you go through the Old Testament and you see the tragic comedy of Yahweh and all the stuff that he does. And I thought, as a writer, did you look at some of the crazy shit that was happening and go, where where do I even go with this? Does that challenge occur to you as a writer? With regard to the character of God? Yes, God uh, in, in the story of God in the book. Um, what I ended up, connect, I, it took me a while to sort of figure out how I wanted to to write him. And I sort of circled around it for a while just taking notes on it and i thought well there's there's a few different ways that i can understand this guy um and one is that he's just kind of um he's a fake he's the wizard of oz he's not who he says he is you know <laughs> but he claims all these powers that he doesn't really have and it's and it's paying no attention to the man behind the curtain and and he's blustery and he's and and so because so many times he says he's going to do things and he doesn't do them like the end of Jeremiah is just like a classic version of that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to destroy Babylon. I'm going to destroy Babylon. And then nothing happens. The end of Jeremiah is one of my favorite bits of comedy in a weird way in the whole book, because it's just like this procedural report at the very end. After all, God's blustering. It's like basically nothing happened. Nothing he said was going to happen. Anyway, you know, he, he's a fraud. So I thought, all right, that's funny. And I thought, well, maybe he's just a fool. You know, he really is all powerful, but he's not all knowing. And he just keeps basically stepping on rakes and hitting himself in the head and getting mad. And, you know, and I, and I liked that, too. I thought that was funny. But I ended up feeling that the most um, interesting to me and the richest and the deepest was, no, this guy's mentally ill. This guy's a freak. There's something wrong with this guy. This guy's in a tremendous amount of pain. And I had a certain moment where I thought, you know, this is a very lonely existence. This is a shatteringly, excruciatingly lonely existence. This character who is presented to us effectively as a human being, he has no friends. He has no mother. He has no father. He has no siblings. He has one child who he basically has brutally murdered. He has an enemy. That's what he has. And he has some sycophantic kind of, you know, angels who float around and, and tell him how great he is all the time. And I thought, this is really brutal, and this is really horrible. And so that kind of grounded him for me, it, that there was a, a kind of a subtle, like, okay, let's say he, he wants it to go this way. This is how he wants it to go. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. And he wants it to go this way. That is so incredibly painful. and. Uh, does not work out the way that he wants it to go. And I, I thought that was really, really fascinating. I thought that was a really interesting character and funny too. It's something I never thought about in my 30 years inside Christianity because I was that guy, right? I was a Bible banging, devout, yeah. Bible literalist, uh, evangelical believer for a lot of years. And it was only after I got out that, and your story wraps a big, big, big bow on this for those of us who didn't catch it early enough. But, you know, the God who's supposed to have a bead on everything, right? Omniscience. He knows everything past, present, and future. Nothing is beyond his sight. He knows that he has the hairs on our heads counted. You know, he'll never. And yet the, the God of the Bible spends all of the, especially all the Old Testament, surprised. Like he's always right. looking around going, well, how the hell did this happen? And then he gets right. pissed off. <laughs> right. 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 And that's one of the angles that you take that's so freaking brilliant, you know, because, you know, God's like, well, shit, that didn't go the way I planned it. And yet if right. God is all knowing, he would have already known it wasn't going to work out and he would not be surprised and then therefore angered. I don't know. You want to talk about the surprise angle, that nature of Yahweh? 
Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's it, it comes back to is he is he just kind of an idiot? Like, well, why did you not see this comment? I mean, or does he want it to go this way? Is this the way he wants it to go? Is it a punishment game? Is that what he's into? Is this a gigantic punishment game? Because it's very clear with Adam and Eve when they're first created, they could live there forever in the garden and presumably be happy. It's right there. It's right there. And then somehow, for some strange reason, Satan, because who else is the serpent but Satan, right? I mean, it really can't be. I mean, given the characters that we have in the story, really, the serpent can't be anyone other than Satan, in my opinion. Yeah. His arch enemy instantly sneaks in and completely fucks his whole story early on. Okay, now this is either incompetence and colossal idiocy, um, or it's something stranger and deeper. And I thought it was much more interesting that it was something stranger and deeper. No, this is how he wants it to go. Adam and Eve perfectly happy in the garden. What the hell is he going to do? What, what is there to do? There's absolutely nothing to do. But all right, let's say Adam and Eve misbehave. Let's say they're disobedient. Let's say they're bad. Oh, now this gets really interesting. He, he can punish them. And he loves to punish. He loves to punish. He takes great glee in it again and again and again from, from throughout the entire book, you know, culminating in, in, in Revelations, which is just an insane torture fest. It's like torture porn by the time you get there. And then he can forgive them, right? And then he can, and then he can forgive them because they'll, you know, people will grovel and be frightened. And then, and then he can like, you know, make a rainbow and say, uh, uh, you know, after like he's killed everyone on earth here, here's a rainbow, Noah. And then everything's okay, maybe for a little bit, but then it starts to go bad again because they're like him. He made them in his image. They're like him. They're him. And of course they go bad and he wants them to go bad. And he loves it when they go bad because he can hurt them and he can hurt himself. He's very masochistic. He's very sadistic. He's very masochistic. He's a very warped character, a very fascinating character. He is by far the most interesting character ever created by human beings. He far surpasses Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, Raskolnikov, uh, you name it. There is no character humans have ever created who rivals this guy for complexity, strangeness, darkness, Occasional glimpses of kindness, which jump out because they're really kind of surprising because it's it's out of character. Um, he's a he's a tremendously interesting, strange character. But I but yeah, I mean, I, I think that the um, I don't think it's just a mistake. I think if it's just a mistake, I think that's a for me that's a less interesting and less funny read. Well, he's an idiot. He, he does stupid things. Like, why didn't you guard the garden? Why did you just let your worst enemy sneak in and completely fuck your story at the, at, on day one, like half an hour after you start? <laughs> like, what is wrong with you? But what if that's the plan? What if that's exactly what he wanted? What if that's, okay, that's really weird. I was talking to a buddy of mine. By the way, everybody, I'm talking to Chris Matheson. He is uh uh, a writer, he's author of the book "The Story of God: A Biblical Comedy About Love and Hate," released a few years back, and it's uh, certainly worth a look. You can pick it up on Amazon and pretty much anywhere online where uh, books are sold. But uh, I was talking to a fellow activist, and he said, "You know, we always in the faith would talk about God as the creator, designer, implementer of the universe, blah blah blah." But we always assumed he was benevolent. Like our first thing, well, you know, of course, it, that first cause, the intelligent designer, the grandfather of the cosmos, we just assume he's a good guy. And yeah. I was talking to Paul and Paul said, well, that's, I don't see how that even follows. Like, what if God was like one of us and we downloaded the Sims game and then we just put the Sims in all these fucked up situations yeah, just to right. watch the, what would happen to them. They'll just to watch the horrors play out. And then when we're laughing hysterically, we put those clips on YouTube and broadcast them to everybody else so they can share in the sadism 
And I just thought to myself that way, well, yeah, that actually is interesting as well. What if yeah. God sort of enjoyed the drama? Hey, let's just stir it up. Let's try this and see what happens. And then it all goes crazy, sometimes out of his control. But, uh, you know, he maybe in that way, he's not happy unless he's miserable. I don't know. Is, is there any truth to is any it, of that? I think, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I won't, at certain points, I thought he's like a kid left in the desert alone with basically a bunch of nuclear weapons. You know, it's just like this guy has no idea what to do with any of this stuff. And I think that he's really. A drama queen. I think he loves drama. Clearly loves drama. And uh, there's no drama in happiness. <laughs> none. There's none. Happy families are not dramatic. They're not. Uh, nobody's interested in them. Nobody writes movies about them. Nobody writes books about them. They're just not. Um, they're great. And if you're lucky enough to be part of one, fantastic, you know. But it's unhappiness and pain and that's really dramatic and interesting and that's that's what he gravitates to again and again and again how do you approach uh, then the character of satan uh you know a lot of times the antagonist in story gets all the best lines sometimes yeah. it's the most relatable you know the scene chewing antagonist comes in and, and it almost becomes the anti-hero perhaps in fact becomes the anti-hero what was your approach to satan i know you went back and and spoke at length about satan in an update of the book so flesh it all out for everybody so they know what we're talking about well he's fascinating right i mean because he's the only one who's there with god from beginning to end he he's the only character who basically is present I mean, now they try and reverse engineer it, I guess, and say Jesus was there at the beginning. But I don't see any signs of Jesus in uh, the Old Testament. I mean, you know, you can, I guess, find them in, in um, Isaiah, but it, that all seems made up to me. Um, no, Satan's there from the start, and he's the only one who talks back. He's the only one who's not intimidated by this guy. He's the only one who will just, and he will, and he's got God's number from the beginning. Like and he knows where the he knows where all the buttons are, right? Is that yeah, is that exactly huh. right. I came to think of it at a certain point that you know God was like Elmer Fudd and Satan was like Bugs Bunny. That he just can <laughs> come in circles around him. That God is so blustery and bombastic and kind of witless in a way and satan is clever and insightful and uh the book of job of course is well it's my favorite i mean if i have to pick one thing out of the whole book i'm gonna pick that because for a couple of reasons well it actually is kind of a beautiful piece of literature it is the language is kind of beautiful whoever wrote it my my belief is that solomon wrote it but i don't think anybody knows who wrote it it's really kind of a beautiful piece but it's really, really funny. And watching Satan kind of lead God into the most colossal and magnificent comedic pratfall in the history of the world is just fantastic, but only by asking him a couple of questions. And this is the atheist question. I think, ultimately, I believe this is the atheist question. And this is the power of where we start. How do you know that? That simple question. How do you know? What makes you so sure about that? Are you sure? What, what is the evidence for that? What happened? And that's essentially what Satan asks him. How do you know? And that leads God into this complete unraveling, which by the end has him talking like a complete lunatic about his pet sea monster and all the doors in his pet sea monster's face. And it's brilliantly brilliantly funny and that i think is the greatest um that is satan's uh most profound appearance in the book he's a great character though you I know mean, of course i liked him i mean you know john milton loved him right i mean how does who's ever read paradise lost and not gravitated to satan as the kind of the hero of the book i mean he's captivating and he's not scared of this guy this guy's a bully, among other things. He's a mentally ill 
bully. And so in a book where everyone's cowed or scared or killed, just flat out killed, um, this guy's not. And I think that's great. And, you know, people will talk about, well, you know, they, what Abraham. It's like he he sort of he talks to God and, and bargains him or negotiates him down, you know, and uh, how many people he's going to kill. Right. And in, in Sodom, I guess. But that's just bullshit because it's meaningless, because God just kills everybody in Sodom anyway. Abraham didn't accomplish anything in that scene. Um, yeah, Satan's great. I guess if yeah, we wanted to be true. reductive, you know, we could always be like, well, how many people did God kill in the Bible? How well, many yeah, people did yeah. Satan actually kill in the Bible? But I'm yeah. more interested, like I'm friends with Lucian Greaves up at the Satanic Temple, and, you know, they're total non-believers in anything supernatural, but they sort of like that character of Satan as, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to reject tyranny, and I'm not going to be told what to do, and I'm going to march to my own drum, and all you guys can just deal with it, right? I mean, that's, that's their version of the devil. And um, yeah, it just drives the, it drives the devout crazy because, I mean, you and I are products of the 80s and 90s, the satanic panic, right? I mean, do you remember back when we were spinning albums backwards and looking under every rock for the devil and hiding our children on Halloween? Did you go through any of that in your life, Chris, during the satanic panic? I remember it. I didn't actually, because that different sort of background, I think, but I do remember what you're talking about. Well, I'm from Oklahoma. I mean, we, the whole... The state symbol is a, you know, it's a big cross. And there's actually a person <laughs> pinned to it. We just put it up on the top of the flag, Christian flag. But I mean, there is a, and it continues today. I mean, people see the devil everywhere they look. And there's this weird, uh, wild insecurity, kind of a pattern seeking scanning of the horizon for evil with a capital E. And, you know, man, if you look for the devil everywhere, you're going to find it. But there is, there is some utility, I think, in taking the thing that most rattles, the easily rattled, right? The stuff that <laughs> totally freaks the people out and sort of mastering that icon and playing it. You can play it for satire, play it for laughs. You can play it to make a point, but you can approach it without fear. And that's what you did in the story of God, really. I mean, you're approaching Satan but you're not afraid of burning in hell, right? I mean, you're not afraid that God's going to, lightning is not going to come from the sky or whatnot. You you were approaching it from a position of, man, I make you sound great when I say fearlessness. I don't know. Is that fair? <laughs> right? You're not worried about the devil when you're writing about the I'm devil. I'm a very, very fearful person. In fact, <laughs> I am not scared of burning in hell forever. No, I'm not. And I'm not. And I don't You've never had that? that You've never had that, oh, shit, what if I'm wrong? Uh, you know, I'm going to cook forever. There is eternal judgment, you know, in the balance. None of that ever struck for you? I don't know. I, not not too much. I mean, I grew up in, a, like, a real new, Southern California, New Agey family, you know? Like, like Satan, like, it was more like ghosts and, and spirits and I psychic see. phenomena and haunted houses and you know that that's like is that you know are ghosts real well i don't know you know i don't think they are by the way but did i did i did that give me pause it probably did when i was a kid but but satan wasn't really part of my reality very much you know i like never set foot in a church literally until i was in my late 20s like no oh, wow not really. i envy i have envy like I, have been. <laughs> I, I mean, when I did, I thought, wow, these are really interesting, man. These are incredibly interesting buildings. You know, there's a lot going on here and I really dug it, but no, I didn't. So therefore Satan was not, yeah, not, 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 didn't really scare me too much. And then, and then when you read the book, why would you be scared of this guy? He's, uh, he's just kind of the little truth teller in the book why is he bad why is he evil because he tells the truth that's why i'm writing that down that's a t-shirt something like that <laughs> so not to digress too much but i mean you're out there in california i mean we're talking about crystals and and that sort of vague yeah. notion of spiritualism uh you know uh, what uh, uh, reincarnation kind of, i mean do you get oh, it yeah. that 
I don't know. Uh, California seems to the stereotype anyway is that, and you know, Sedona <laughs> and a few other places are very woo woo, new agey. None of that for you. But the the new age, uh, the woo woo, new age stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. All, I mean, was all. that was that your normal? If a literal Bible yeah, yeah. was not. Yeah, 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 completely. Yeah, but it, it didn't rub off on you. You weren't, uh, um, you know, checking your no. horoscope and all that stuff. No, I, you know, I've thought about this a lot, and um, <clears throat> I just didn't like it. You know, from the time I was a kid, I just I didn't like it. It didn't. I didn't find it exciting. I didn't find it like sort of cool. It just kind of felt weird and sort of sickly to me like there's something like i don't like this i don't like thinking about this stuff i don't want to go to a seance where some medium supposedly has ectoplasm coming out of their nose that forms a little body that will then talk and answer questions of the departed i just like there there's nothing about this that i like and at a certain age, because of my inclination, I guess, and becoming a comedy writer, I just thought, this is ridiculous. This stuff's ridiculous and foolish. And I don't believe in any of it. And that was actually the first stuff that I didn't believe in. Like astrology would have been my entry point for atheism in a weird way. Because like, this is bullshit. You know what I mean? This is bullshit. This doesn't describe me. This psychic is just, this uh, astrologer is just saying the most general broad things that you could say to anybody and, and people just sort of nod and go, oh my God, yeah, how could you possibly know that about me? Um, so that was what kind of steered me away or started my path, <clears throat> I would say, away from belief, maybe. Oh, I'm I'm grieved, you know, I, your aura is diminishing. I see an aura <laughs> all around you. Yeah, it's the very spectrum great, has yeah, weekend. Yeah, it's a good a thing. Fortunately, I have my spirit animal and uh, my spirit ah, animal, my totem. This is Linus. He sits in my lap as I do interviews. He was just sort of is rustling. That true? Picked him up here. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's my, he's my emotional support animal. He just stays with me all the time. I love that his name's Linus. Yeah. His name's Linus. Yeah. He, he was, yeah, uh, he's, a, Linus. he's a little rescue. He's, um, you know, he's sort of a happy ending to kind of a challenging time in our life. And he's six pounds of ankle high death, actually mostly just love. He is a descendant of the wolf. And, uh, mm -hmm. anyway, he didn't realize. You can absolutely he's, see that. I he's a, he's, that you're in some danger when you hold him like that. <laughs> a wolf-like nature. So do you ever get any pushback? I mean, you know, California is not a fundamentalist state, but with all the uh, sort of spiritism and stuff going on, the fact that you've taken this harder line, the book comes out half a decade ago and you've taken, you know, pretty, pretty good shot at uh, a sacred cow in the Christian faith. You ever get any blowback for any of that? I don't really do social media. Um, so to the degree that I would get it, and I probably would if I opened myself up to that, I just haven't. I'm just not really present for that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I got some in my own family, you know, because my dad was like, oh, he was the true believer in all the new age stuff. And, oh, yeah, he and I definitely got into it many, 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 many times. Those are tough conversations. You know, it's it's a cost benefit. You sit there and you go, do I engage? Nothing will come of it. This way madness lies. But at the same time, I feel like I need to be myself and state my position. And I shouldn't sit on my hands just because it's family. But then it's going to create conflict. Mean, do you have that tug of war? Because that's sort of been part of my background. Has that ever happened with you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was very, very close with my dad. And I would say this was the reason that our relationship unraveled. In fact, I was very close. I mean, we grew up going to baseball games and, and going to the movies and playing catch and playing. You know, we were, we, I, I loved my dad. I love my dad, you know, and we spent a lot of time together. But he was a true believer in all of this stuff. Uh, astrology, life after death, psychic phenomena, seances, ghosts, haunted houses, you know, all of that and more, you know, pyramid power, crystal power, mm -hmm. everything, you name it, if it's new age, he basically believed in it. And um, at a certain point, I just, I, I, it just, 
I, I couldn't, uh, I kept my mouth shut for a certain amount of time because I didn't want to wreck my relationship with my dad. But then at a certain point, you know, it's as you say, well, do you, do you, how long do you bite your tongue before you say, actually, I don't think I agree with you about this, dad. I don't, that's not what it looks like to me. Um, and so, yeah, we began and, and then uh, we just kept going. And uh, a lot of the good stuff burned off. We just sort of argued and uh, that wasn't great. And I suppose I could have pulled the plug on it, but we were both sort of um, stubborn, I think. And I don't think he thought he was going to persuade me. And I knew I wasn't going to persuade him. But I don't think either one of us really wanted to back down. So we just kept going. I think, too, it becomes difficult. You know, family, those discussions with a, a parent, a sibling, whatever, uh, you know, there's this sort of um, familial equity that they bring in, especially a parent. You know, they occasionally, I think, will give themselves permission to maybe cross a boundary. You know, they might be more inclined to say, well, we didn't raise you this way, meaning that we raised you to think like this, live like this vote like this, believe like this, and you're not exactly playing the uh, song we wrote for you, pal. And so you need to get back on track. But you know, it, what it does is it strips you of your autonomy and, and your authentic self. Like you don't get a chance to sort of tap on the glass and find out where you are, what you want, what your value system is. And that's, and it's also, you know, the other layers to the onion are, it's not like even if they believe lies, they're not lying to you. They're convinced it's true. They really want to help. They're acting often out of love. So all of these family dynamics come into play, and there's just no binary bumper sticker way through it, is there? Um, no. It just um, it just s- sucks. <laughs> you, yeah, kind of. You know, I mean, it's like it was like I had a fundamentalist parent. I did. He was a fundamentalist, just not. Know, uh, of new age religion and i'm an atheist and that's tough unless we're just not going to talk about it all we're going to talk about is the dodgers or something if we're going to get into anything and it's just so easy to get into that stuff right because it's a it's a it's a philosophy of life it's a way of looking at existence it's it's just pretty hard to to steer around it completely because so many things can lead to a conversation that goes that way and um, anybody yeah. in your family ever crack open your book to your knowledge or do they just sort of. He, um, yes, my mother did before she passed away. And uh, my mother was kind of a skeptic. I think that's where I got it from. My siblings, as far as I know, all basically followed dad's path. I think they all pretty much um, believe. Um, my mom was not sure. Uh, I think maybe she wanted to believe that he was right. She liked the idea of like, well, we'll go to heaven and we'll we'll see each other again and we'll be united forever. And, you know, she, that appealed to her, but I don't think she really believed it. And so um, I I think I got some of my skepticism from, from her. And so she read it and I think she thought it was funny. She was like, I have notes for you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> see what like, you okay, should have well, done is you should have gone here with the character son here let's yeah, sit down sit down yeah, yeah. Uh, we are going to take some uh, questions from uh, the audience i'm guessing uh, sam or someone's going to feed those our directions and uh, uh, i would encourage the cre- the questions to go to go to chris uh, not that anyone's going to ask me a question but i want to make sure like he's uh, he's the you know, very much Seth, the, honestly I could do an interview of you sometime. Like, how did you get from being a true believer to here? Like, how, well, that's the. Really I wrote a book about it, but but the the short version is is this. Okay, I was raised to have the sort of this the cook. I was raised in this mindset where I was lucky enough out of all the people on the planet to be born at the right place to the right time, the right family, the right belief, the right Bible, the right version of my Christianity. Everybody else was deceived. And then they pound this stuff into your head by surrounding you with only affirmation. Like, I don't know. I don't live around people who disagreed with me. I didn't have anybody who ever challenged me. So, I mean, all you get is validation until you're an adult and you're totally unprepared for the world. 
And, you know, I was also told that doubt was a sin, right? Who's the disciple in the Bible that, that uh, you know, your parents never told you to be like? They were like, be like Peter, be like Paul, be like John. They were never like, be like Thomas, doubting <laughs> Thomas, right? No, I never said that because Christ was like, no, I mean, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind, and that person should expect to receive nothing from God. And uh, so, you know, doubt's a problem, and yet we use doubt as a mechanism to protect ourselves in every aspect of our life, right? We tell our kids, stranger pulls up, opens the car door, doubt that it's safe, run away. If somebody shows up and says, hey, I can make you a million dollars, just need your bank account information, we doubt that they're telling us the truth, and it protects us. You know, we use doubt all the time. But religions, you know, their protective shell is, well, doubt's a sin. So I finally had to come to a point, short answer where I had to give myself permission to go ahead and doubt and then just keep following the questions. And if the answers weren't satisfactory to ask more questions and that's a scary place, you know, there's a lot of consequences, uh, familial, social, even professional career consequences, life consequences for those who don't toe the line. So it was a hard journey, but I'm, you know, I'm gl- I'd never go back. Like I'd never want to go back into the safety of the cocoon. There's a much uh, my friend Gail Jordan says there's so much more light, air, and space on this side of the question. You know, I just, I'm so much happier. So, how old were you? Uh, I was 37 when I first uh, realized I was an atheist. So, I'm a slow learner, Chris. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's, a lot of indoctr- that's a lot of indoctrination. You know? That's a slow, slow <laughs> learner. And, you know, I, a lot of that is just, I think when you, when you wonder if it, any of it makes sense, I think you'd go what I call dormant in the faith, I, which is you wear God like the awareness ribbon. You know, oh, yeah, of course I believe in God. I don't really care. I don't go to church. I don't really pray over meals. And, you know, I, I live a pretty secular life. But if anybody asks me at a party, well, of course I believe in God because that's, that's the safe zone, right? Oh, well, I'm still, I may not be attending class, but I'm still on the rolls. But, you know, if you're honest enough to say, well, wait a minute, what if those next steps can be really scary? And a lot of people never get out. They never get past those little outer ridges. And it took me a few years to get there. And now kind of my gig is to encourage other people. I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. Certain relationships, I would assume, fell by the wayside. Yeah, I I could relate to the story with your father. My parents are both theologians, right? My mother wrote a Greek New Testament study guide. She teaches New Testament Greek, you know, in her 80s. And I'm like the worst nightmare. Like, oh, our son that we trained up, Christian school and weekly church and prayers. I am now, I am now ahead of one of the biggest atheist communities in the world. And it's just like, it's brutal, Chris. It's brutal. <laughs> do, do, do you maintain a relationship with your parents? Uh, as long as boundaries are observed. Again, families tend to give themselves permission to do things that they really don't get to do. And so I had to push back. You know, you don't get to call and text and name and shame and guilt. And and you don't get to tell me that I'm I'm an embarrassment. And you don't get to do all those things. Like you know, yeah. mother, father, no, whatever. I don't care what the Bible says that, you know, you don't get a pass. And as long as you can observe boundaries and we can, we can disagree on the subject, but still live in an attitude of respect as people, I'm good. But uh, if, if you won't do that, then I'm going to have to close the door. And I did for a number of years until things now, now it's kind of an uneasy piece. You ever see Ghostbusters 2 where they had the river of slime under the city of New York? That's what my family get togethers are like. Everything is happy, clappy on the, on the asphalt, on the highway. And then right under the highway, there's the river of slime that nobody knows or nobody's talking about. That's what family get-togethers are like. I totally get that. I totally anyway. get that. Are they proud of you at all? Do you ever get that? Because you've done great. I mean, are they proud? Have you ever heard that? Not remote. They're just horrified. I, oh. I, you know, it's a, it's a crisis. It's a phase. Uh, I worship at the Church of Atheism. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just want attention, uh, anything other than Seth read the, the book filled with talking animals, flying chariots of fire, giants and supermen who gain power based on hair length and thought there might be some problems with it. Anything other than that. Right. So, 
But uh, hey, you know what? It's good. And I've also discovered, since you and I are just being philosophical, that I think family comes in many forms. While I don't have a great relationship with my bio family, I have gained a family in, in many other ways. I mean, family acts like family. So to know that there are people in this world who have your back, and this is what I tell people who come from shunning cultures like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and whatnot, where they've just been cast off, ex-Muslims cast off completely, and they have no one. And I'm like, well, you know, you can have a family. We're not necessarily on the immediate family tree, but we can still act like family. We are all the human condition. We've got your back. We will protect you. We will do what families do. And I've been honored enough to have that around the world. So, I mean, not, honestly, I've, I've got no complaints. We all, all families are dysfunctional, aren't they, Chris? <laughs> I mean, ultimately, yes, I suspect that's true. Some are highly dysfunctional. And yeah. others may be mildly dysfunctional. I, I sometimes wonder whether those of us who reject the belief system that we grew up in, perhaps not necessarily, but maybe uh, there is an opening for a um, marriage or a long-term romantic relationship that, that is just so important, right? Like it's so um, essential, I think. I think um, friendships are too, um, relationships with kids are, that it's like you, you, that impulse to build your own reality, build your own life as you move away from the one you were born into. Yeah, I mean, for me, at the end of the day, I just think it, it becomes about boundaries. You know, if you want to believe in, you want to believe in the story of God, okay. But the minute that becomes proactive and it bleeds into, you know, the bending of the Constitution or the co-opting of our government or naming and shaming our LGBT friends or or telling me that as an atheist, I am essentially aligned with everything that's wrong with the world, everything from tsunamis to child cancer to whatever, you know, I mean, you just don't get to do that. It's, it's really for me, it's, it all comes back to boundaries. Uh, Sam, I'm seeing a couple of questions. I see one that says the nuns, the non-religious are on the rise. Do you ever think the non-religious will be the majority in the U.S. or in the world? Do you want to play philosopher, Chris Matheson? What do you think? This rising <laughs> secularization? I, mean, I, don't I don't expect to see it in my lifetime. And I would be surprised if my kids or even grandkids saw that. But it does seem to me that you know, if I imagine 500, 700 years from now, yeah, I could, I could see that happening. I mean, I would like to think so because I think these, uh, I, I think it would be better. I, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I'm, I, th I think a less superstitious world is a better world. Uh, and you know, I'm not too worried about the, I'm not worried about, you know, the people who aren't taking advantage of other people. I'm not worried about the, the non-dogmatic, you know, the deistic believer, you know, I'm not worried yeah. about that, but you know, yeah. it's, it's the, it's the crazy, it's the Marjorie Taylor greens, you know, <laughs> of the world, right? We look at that and go, how do, no, the world would be better with less of that. Let's do less of that. Right. Yeah. yeah and sure. um, so, you know, someone had said something on my Facebook page the other day, they're like, well, if religion died tomorrow, there would be no homophobia. And I said, well, there would be much less of it, yeah. but I think tribalism, bigotry, et cetera, exist outside of religious models and they'll exist as part of the human condition. But I think, you know, we're better without, it was it Bertrand Russell. He said, if, uh, you know, if it's true, we should believe it. If it's not true, we should not believe it. And if we right. don't know, we should withhold judgment. That seems kind of basic to me, Chris, you know, right. Right. Uh, someone asked, what's the first thing you're going to do when things are back to normal post COVID Chris Matheson? I mean, come on, perfect world. You want to get on a plane? <laughs> Is there a restaurant you miss? Yeah. What do you want to do? Yeah. Get on a plane, go somewhere. You know, it's been kind of, uh, been pretty housebound. I think like most people and, uh, yeah, take a trip. Are you this. normally though? Are you normally kind of a. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but not this much, you know. I mean, like basically uh, a year of, you know, go to the grocery store and put on a mask and, and uh, you know, that's about it. I mean, I haven't been out to eat in a year. I haven't been to a movie in a year. I haven't been, you know, really done anything. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to doing it. Have you felt 
a tremendous discouragement about the inability or unwillingness to follow basic mask instructions during a global pandemic. Like I can't tell you how many masks I see here. And I'm, I'm reminded of an onion article that came out and it said, scientists have confirmed that nose holes do connect to lungs, right? <laughs> like pull the mask <laughs> all the way. I mean, do you look around and think, you know, some of these people shouldn't leave the house without helmets. There's something wrong with people. This is basic. Does that bother you at all, Chris? Yeah. Yeah. There's just some people who just seem so mad, you know, they're just so mad in this thing of like, you know, don't, don't tell me what to do, which is it's just built into American culture, I guess, you know, it's this just intense sort of individualism of like, don't anybody tell me what to do. And, and then I guess some sense that ma a mask, if you wear a mask, it makes you seem weak and scared. And, and the worst thing you can possibly be in this world is weak and scared. I, you know, so many of these people, they're just, their vibe is like, I'm not scared. I ain't scared, you know? And it's like, well, you know, Meanwhile, they're carrying an AR-15 to Starbucks, you know? Yeah, you're super weird scared. World. You're, you're, right, you're the, like the most scared. <laughs> you know, yeah, it seems like I, I saw a bumper sticker the other day, which I just, I don't know, it seemed to get at something. It was a, uh, it was on this pickup truck, of course. And, and it basically said, why? Because fuck you. That's why. <laughs> like, oh, God. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. You know why don't know there's a state of that. What would Jesus do? I'm not sure Jesus yeah. would have had that particular. Symbol. Yeah, I don't think so. It's it is kind of it seems to be in many ways a uniquely American, uh, at least an evangelical conservative American attitude where we want all the freedoms, but we don't really want all or any of the responsibilities, like societal responsibilities. I mean, when did looking out for our neighbors, you know, when did being compassionate about people who have compromised immune systems or elderly parents or maybe working in healthcare and could go infect their patients, you know, our first thought I mean, isn't for them. I mean, it's, you know, Trump does have a lot to do with it, right? Because he just could have said, wear them. Hey, they look cool. You know, you, hey, yeah. dudes, you know, you look like a bandit. You look like a banker. You look cool. You look bad at it. would have been so easy. It's just right there. But instead, it's like, no, it connotes weakness. Did I, uh, was I reaching when I compared your depiction of Yahweh in the Bible to many of the attitudes of Donald Trump? Or there, no. Do you connect those dots? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, he's ridiculously, horrifyingly like the character of Yahweh in, in the Old Testament. This sort of uh, blustery, cruel foolishness is, is Yahweh and Trump. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of remarkable. I was struck by it again and again, actually. I, in my own heart, have I have no inclination to think that he has any God belief at all. Uh, uh, and knowing, I mean, if, if he's out there holding the Bible up, he's holding up the Bible. He doesn't read in front of the church. He does not own after tear grassing the crowd to get there. But, but I mean, would you, was that your perception? You get the vibe that he just knows what his audience wants and he's playing the props of Christianity for them. It's very hard to believe that that guy actually reads the Bible or knows anything about it or, or takes it seriously. I just, I can't even fathom how, how that could be true. And maybe he's one of the very rare end of the individuals in the world that would benefit from it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like if he stumbles on the right verses, yeah. he could yeah, use a little right. help. Read, read Ecclesiastes, you know, maybe he'll <laughs> get something like that. that one's Did that happen for you what though? Are you do? What are you, what are you, what's for you on the other side of COVID? Uh, for me? Uh, yeah. Well, I feel like I cheated a little bit, Chris. I mean, do you work from home like I do? Do you most your creative yeah. work in your, yeah, I've already, so I've already got my safe space here. I've got a dog in my lap. I've got, you know, a diet yeah. root beer just a few feet away. And, and I, I'm, I, I do miss travel. I miss connecting in the convention circuit with people because, you know, a lot of the times when we get together at free thought events, it is our chance to be around people who aren't patting us on the head like we are a science fair project and saying, you poor, poor thing, you know. Uh, I really miss those people. I think one of the first things I would like to do is connect uh, 
person to person at an event of like-minded people, or at least people who respect each other's rejection of superstition. That's good yeah. medicine for me. You know, that's going to be yeah. one of the first things. Absolutely. And um, beyond that, I, I miss I miss just a good old bowl of chips and queso at a Mexican. I just want to go sit in a Mexican restaurant with a big bowl of chips and queso. I just, I want it. I want it now. So it right. will happen. I think you and I are close to the bubble on time. Sam, are we uh, are we pushing the top of the clock? I think we probably are. I'll turn things back over. But, you know, one thing and one final note here for you, Chris, I, you had to have re really your book, The Story of God, had to have been a crash course in the Bible, like a book you were probably familiar with anyway. Otherwise, why bother? But to get into the Bible to the point where you could write the story of God. You became a student of the scriptures in a pretty substantial way, right? Yeah, I studied it. I mean, I really, really immersed myself in it for a good chunk of time. You know, it's a big book. And to really read it, to really try to take it in and, and, and consider it and, and, and ponder it. Yeah, I bet, I bet for a year I was sort of just going through it and taking notes and then going through it again and taking more notes and trying to connect dots and trying to sort of make sense of it. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I'd read it. Uh, I'd read it. It was like the third time. The first time I read it, I don't think I got anything out of it. It was just sort of like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This isn't for me, which would have been in my late 20s. And then I think in my 40s, I got a little more out of it. But it was really, it was, yeah, it was like my late 40s, early 50s where I was like, holy shit, <laughs> holy shit, this is so incredible and this is so incredibly funny. If you take this seriously, this is so utterly ridiculous, the picture here. Well, it's, everybody support the book. It's called The Story of God. Uh, Chris Matheson, you can just Google it. It'll pop up. But Chris, do you have a, a personal website or you just direct everybody to Amazon? What's the best place to do just it? Just Amazon. Yeah, yeah, Amazon. And uh, I just uh, I just think it's it's a, a fantastic way to approach this sort of sacred cow. You know, you look at it with fresh eyes on your terms and draw a big red flashing and very entertaining circle around all of the insanity of it in the hopes of sort of gently nudging people toward better and more humanistic ideas. So, man, it's been a great uh, conversation, and it's been an honor to hang, and I look forward to shaking your hand after COVID in person someday soon, okay? I agree, Seth. It's great talking to you. It's an honor. Thanks again, guys.